1940, people had gathered from miles around to hear the sounds of Walter Barnes and his swing band, the Royal Creolians, who were going to play a one-night stand here in the city of Natchez. They were to perform that evening at the Rhythm Club, a shanty shack of a place, but a place that was prime and ripe for good entertainment. It had tin walls and tin roof a structure that stood about 36 feet across the front, about 124 feet deep. It was not a large structure, but it was open and willing for folks to come to hear this dynamic band play on that evening. The dance at the Rhythm Club was operated by Ed Frazier. And he would have dances in there frequently, as a matter of fact, he had a little dance there the week before the Rhythm Club dance. Uh, he was excited about Walter Barnes coming here. He had heard that Walter Barnes was in Florida playing. He wasn't for sure, but uh, he knew that he was coming here. And the Money Oasis Club knew that he was coming here, and that was a big social club in town. And he decided, the a president decided, we're going to try to get him to play for this big dance. I was graduating the year of the fire. We look forward to the fire, I mean, to the dances coming. I say we. Everybody was excited about them. You know, they put up uh, uh, signs on the telephone post, uh, you know, advertising that the, ba the band was coming. And usually they did come through. Um, on their way to New Orleans, making one night, night stands here in Natchez. So people in Natchez kind of look forward to the dances. The admission for the dance was 50 cents. And at that time, 1940, 50 cents was a great deal of money. Everybody in the black community who considered themselves anybody was planning to attend that dance. There were a lot of uh, very uh, prominent Afro-American people who had attended that. And you know, everywhere you got a certain party group, you know, and there were certain things that when so-and-so came to town, you know, you would automatically call them up and say, I got your ticket saved for you because you know they want one. I was graduating that year, but I was not a, a popular one in the class. I, it, this was coming at the end of uh, the Depression, and rather it was right in the middle of it, I guess. And my father hadn't been working, so I knew we didn't have money for me to go to the dance. So I, even though I wanted to go, I knew I couldn't go. And uh, uh, Ruth Brown, who was one of those who died, was buried over in the City Cemetery, Ruth Brown, um, who lived right there on the railroad, and I walked home together, and she was saying she was going to 
beg her grandfather for a quarter so she could go. Um, so I left her at Union Street, came on home. I knew there was no possibility of my going. Came home and of course uh, the evening went so slowly but I was halfway, I don't know if you call it moping, crying, whatever, you know, because I knew they were going. And my brother, he, uh, everybody was going through it. Mom danced the call. Uh -huh. And uh, so my parents and them wasn't particular about him going. Didn't want him to go wrong, but he was a young man, you feel what I'm talking about? So what he did when he finished that evening, he went home, got his bath, and just went on out like a young man would do, and uh, went on to that dance. We was in, we had been in the we was a nightclub all night, drinking our beer and stuff, you know, and laughing and grinning. Everything, and then we went to the restaurant across the street. He had good fried catfish and all that good food that we like. And we got through eating, we went back up in there a while. I did, but my husband made me go home. But I would have been up in there if it hadn't been for my husband. He said, "Uh, uh, you you're not gonna stay out here all night." We were going home, and he took me home. The owners of the club had decorated the place with uh, flowers and the dangling Spanish moss that often hung from the many of the trees throughout the South. Because the moss was oftentimes found to have small bugs in it, it had been sprayed with flint, which was a petroleum-based insecticide. It was really good for repelling bugs. Unfortunately, it was also very good for inviting a fire. The 50 cents admission, he said, I don't want those people to peep in. So he nailed up the windows. He said, I don't want them trying to break in the back door because we won't be able to see them. So he nailed up the back door. So actually, that was a trap set, not knowingly. But it was, because it was only one way in and one way out. We're standing here in front of the fire station number seven, which was the Phoenix Fire Company's station, approximately four blocks from the nightclub fire itself. This was the first due fire engine company that arrived at the fire. This was one of two stations in the city of Natchez that had a paid fireman on duty 24 hours a day to augment the city's entire volunteer force. What was so unique about this arrangement was, is that the city of Natchez was still protected by 13 independent fire companies. These fire companies enjoyed their pride because they were well over 100 years old. The Phoenix Fire Engine Company that had quarters here at this building was the first company to arrive at the scene of the fire. They had but a short four block run to the nightclub. And in fact, the fireman's name was Walcott. And when he got the alarm, he gunned his engine, pulled out into the street. What he did here, once he started getting closer and closer to the nightclub, was horrific, hor horrible human screaming in the night. Uh, the screaming was just intense, and it just got worse and louder as he got to the scene. When he arrived on the scene, another volunteer had showed up almost immediately. They were able to catch a fire hydrant on the uh, about a half a block west of the nightclub. They laid in with a supply line and then quickly went about stretching the first attack hose to hit the fire. They were just confronted with a mass of humanity everywhere. And you can imagine two firemen being greeted by several hundred people in various stages of distress and injury is overwhelming to anyone. It had to weigh on them uh, uh, um, and have an effect on them uh, during that time. Uh, way more than it would us because of the simple fact that now we have help. We have, uh, you know, when, when something like that happens, we bring in people, uh, psychiatrists and these type of people to talk to our guys and see if they have any problems to help them along with that. Back during that time in the 40s, that didn't exist. So they just had to cope with that the best way they could. 
so you know uh, that makes a difference. And even 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 with that, it's something that you never forget. I mean, uh, it's just something that stays with you. Within a few early minutes of the fire after Phoenix Engine Number no. 7 arrived, two other volunteer fire companies showed up right away, and also uh, a large cadre of volunteer firemen arrived. The officers of these men uh, quickly told the firefighters to start assisting the injured and the various people in stages of distress that were milling about the outskirts of the nightclub. The uh, firefighting actually went fairly quickly. In fact, in, in some of the records, probably within 20 to 30 minutes, the fire was completely knocked down and or totally extinguished except for some burning debris. Uh, part of the tragedy that the firemen encountered at that time is that breathing apparatus did not exist. The firemen had to eat smoke. Several of the firefighters went into the building as far as they could and one of the smoke eaters came out right away and he says, Chief, I think I'm running into a pile of bodies. I can't get any further. Uh, only one way uh, in and one way out of that place and that wasn't barred and that was the front door. So anybody that tried to get out of a, a back door or a window or anything, didn't have any way to escape anyway. There were bodies that were literally interlocked with each other, and from that point on, uh, nothing could be done to, to move it. People behind them, wanting to get out, suffered the same fate. What was also very interesting to the firemen as they brought in their searchlights off the fire truck because uh, they had lost all the electricity uh, during the course of the fire in the club and no lights were present, is that uh, some of the bodies actually bore no sign of outward injury. They basically, suffered because of lack of oxygen. Some other bodies too were, were essentially compressed and because of the weight of other bodies on top of them. There were bodies that were burnt because some were in the direct path of the flames and there were some bodies that basically looked scalded. As water hit the burning material, it became superheated, reflected off of the hot metal surface of the club's walls and roofs and we had an instant steam conversion. 212 degrees Fahrenheit makes steam. So the steam cloud would quickly aid, unfortunately, in injuring the people while putting out the fire at the same time. And the first thing I remember uh, after I went to bed half crying um, was my father's friend coming off Bullmouth Street and he was just yelling, it was about 12, and he was just crying and saying, George, George, come out here, George, and help me find my daughters. I believe both my daughters were burned up in the fire. George, come out here and help me. So we all jumped up and came to the door and uh, when he started calling, uh, we all rushed to the front and we could look straight down this little street. And of course you could see the lights pop on, lamp light, and um, people screaming all the way down that little street. And uh, people were just screaming all over town. And most of the students that were lost in the Rhythm Nightclub fire were students at Brumfield School. Now there were a number of students from Holy Family 
and the Natchez College High School uh, in the black communities. And persons from those schools were lost in that fire. But the, the larger tragedy of the fire was the, the number of faculty and particular faculty that were lost in that fire. We lost coaches in the athletics that we had. We lost music directors in the voice and, of course, Woodridge McGuire, who was the band director. Uh, my father came and sat on the bed and woke me up with tears in his eyes. And he told me, he said, James, he's, you know, I don't know whether I'm saying this verbatim or not, but in essence, you know, he said, you ain't got no more music teacher. You know, and I jumped up. What you mean, Daddy? You know what I mean? Well, Woodrick is dead, you know. I said, Woodrick is dead. He said, yeah, so they had a big fire at the dance, and uh, Woodrick was there, and he was burned to death, along with some of your other band members. You know what I mean? And that's when I first found out about it. You know, there was no more sleep for me. And uh, we up the night, uh, a cousin of mine, George Washington, he came there and we up the night. Well, my, he was my daddy's cousin, bro. So he called, so he asked, uh, come there and knock on the door and say, is, is David here? Isn't that my brother's name was David? Huh? No, I see. He went somewhere to see me. So he didn't say no more. So he said, well, why? He said, well, it's a, it's a big fire up there. There's a big dance there at the River Nightclub. And, and, and then one down, and a whole lot of people were one up in it. And everybody just hit the floor then. Uh -huh. Excited, you know. Uh -huh. Didn't know definitely that he was bad. They didn't, they didn't know he had gone from the bank. And uh, so uh, I went up there myself. I know my dad and them went, mom and them went. But I went up there myself. Boy, I was the youngest one. Huh? He was six years older than I am. And uh, I went up. Uh, now I went, they had bodies, people were lying. Uh, William, William and William funeral home, Mac a funeral home. And I don't know about Wesley, I can't remember. Oh, uh, Will, Will, There's those three I don't remember. Uh -huh. They had what they parked their uh, garage for the horses and whatnot. <laughs> People just laying up, dead. So I went and I, I found him with that macker, laying all of that to the side. Oh, God. Baby, it was awful. And for three funeral homes in there, our garages were stacked high with bodies. We had to go in Mackles. We had been in all of them, couldn't find John, and went to Mackles, and there he was laying up on the fire. My brother, now, he just had some beast scars on his leg, but his wife was burned to a crisp. Just could tell by her bracelet and watch and different things that she had on that didn't burn. That's the only way you could tell her. But he was just natural. He was just laying. Uh, you know, they stacked them up, ooh, it was just every funeral home there, three, right together on the mold. And it was <laughs> stacked up mile high. All of them did. Now, afterwards, man, uh, 
everybody was running around, crying, upset, trying to identify bodies. Some undertakers were coming from out of town, trying to assist the undertakers here in uh, burying those people, and it was just a whole lot of stuff that was going on. It was a lot of confusion, I can tell you that much. Oh, everybody was saying, people that, everybody had lost somebody, either cousin, brothers, friends, or something. friends, or something. Everybody lost somebody. Daddy went off with uh, Mr. White, and he later came back and said that both the girls, neither of the girls were at the charity hospital, which was the only other place they could have been other than up there. So um, it, it was just a time when everybody just was just sort of crying and carrying on. And you asked me about what the atmosphere around that just was like, I can tell you this. The town for a long time was never the same. It really wasn't. Uh, there was one man who was there who had been over the cemetery at that time, Mr. McKinley Barnes, and he worked with us in the cemetery. And uh, he showed us where the graves were, where the pits were. It seems like they just dug uh, deep pits, I think. I can't remember exactly, but I think he said there was something like six by eight feet deep or something like that, and they just threw so many into each one. You couldn't tell whether they were men, women, or They had them like in a long bag, and they'd have them in like a trench, not an individual grave. So you have maybe 10 or 15 people might be in one, one of those trenches, right. or more. And and w while we're standing here, that, that's the rhythm nightclub section right in there. From them, them stones out to that tree on us, that's, that's a certain part of them. Mm -hmm. That's not all of them, because they scattered all through this place. A lot, of, a lot of people had their own lot, and they put their relatives in there instead of having to bear them all in this, in this massive spot. Not only because of these uh, isms and ideas, they had uh, they just didn't go down there to the back of the cemetery. And it had grown up terribly, overgrown, almost like a forest back there. And uh, thanks to the garden club who helped, we cleared it up. And uh, I know it looks a lot better than it did. A few of the graves that where people were identifiable <clears throat> are buried up on that hill. I don't know if you noticed coming down to that area, that low area. There's some that are buried up there, and they have the dates on them and uh, information on them. But those down at the bottom were just thrown into those pits and uh, covered up, tried to forget it, I guess, tried to forget Individuals don't come out and really see about their loved ones, so we do all they we strive on a donation type contribution to pay other individuals to work out here to clean it up, try to clean it up and maintain it. So like I said, it, it means a lot to me to see it kept clean. That's why I've been fooling around here so long, but you, you get started and you, you get some help right off the begin in the beginning. Then after so long, I don't know, I guess they just get tired and they leave it alone and it'll grow back up like that over there. Now that's, that's a disgrace to me.
Don't worry about a big funeral. Just give me a basic funeral and, and take part of it and donate it to the cemetery as a first um, donation toward a perpetual care situation. So, I don't know. People don't know do what you want me to do. If I get a chance, I'll do it myself. But anyway, that's the way I'm hoping and thinking that maybe if I can get, if I can donate it, and let people know. Uh, I, I thought about, I had bought some bricks and they're out there near the cemetery. And I thought we could put up a little uh, something that says this is dedicated to those uh, 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 caretakers, benevolent tech caretakers, Stelma White, who gave, and then maybe others would donate, you know. Just, that would be a, my wish. After a year and a half of working on the Rhythm Club fire, what still haunts me the most is the mass grave and the forgotten victims who are buried there. There's no marker, no headstone, or anything to indicate that they're even there. To steal a movie quote, they should have sent a poet, because I cannot describe in words what you feel standing at the bottom of that hill, overlooking the plot, and knowing what happened there all those years ago. For 70 years, this story's been forgotten or ignored by the pages of history. It's about more than a fire at a nightclub. It's about a chain of events that would change the direction of an entire community forever. Mm -hmm.